I was standing by, by the door and I was actually thinking that I hope he's not going to read all that bullshit the communication department writes. <laughs> and then uh, after that I thought, God, I wish my mom and dad were here. My dad would have been proud and my mom might have even believed it. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me bring good wishes from our union, the United Steelworkers. When uh, Ron was reading out the name of our union, I knew he had to be reading from a teleprompter because I can't even remember the real name of the union. I just call it the Steelworkers Union. But uh, I want to uh, recognize your three officers, Ron, Randy, and Oscar. But if you allow me a, a slight privilege, I also want to recognize two really good friends, a fellow Pittsburgher, Warren George, who uh, I've gotten to know. <laughs> who I've gotten to know at the AFL-CIO and have a tremendous admiration for. And an old friend who's about as ugly as a mud truck, uh, Ken Foster. But uh, he actually gets the job done pretty good. And I've known him for many, many years when we were on the uh, Canadian Labour Council uh, executive board together. You know, your union has a proud history. I know that my friend Cecil Roberts was here and Rich Trumka and I know, as Warren George tells me, that there's always this argument about which union came first, the ATU or the United Mine Workers. Warren's position is that ATU had to come first because you were above ground. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure if I should complain because uh, I can't imagine a worse speaking position than coming after both Rich Trumka and Cecil Roberts. And I can tell you that I know that if Cecil was, was here, he said something like this. If you want good wages, join a union. If you want good benefits, join a union. If you want weekends off, join a union. And if you want to be able to tell the boss to kiss your ass, join a union. <laughs> so I won't repeat what Cecil said. But let me say this. You're meeting at a very crucial time, and you're going to have your own democracy here today. But once that democracy is over, we've all got a hell of a chore ahead of us, because we may have one of the most important elections in our adult lifetime coming up this year. If you watch what's going on, and the way the anger has been generated, and the way it's been fed by right-wing hairpin, nut jobs, boneheads, every word you can imagine, steering anger in the wrong direction. Republicans who are out there campaigning, think of the gall of all this. I gotta take my damn jacket off. Republicans who are out there campaigning on doing away with Social Security and privatizing it, believing we're going to get amnesia. Think about 2008. What if your dad or your grandma had been in a privatized Social Security scheme? Imagine if you were on the verge of retiring and counting on your Social Security and had been privatized. And you go to bed at night, you wake up in the morning and 40% of it is gone, not because of any you did. 14 sitting Republicans have publicly said, including John McCain, that you have to privatize Social Security. A number of Republicans have said, are there any veterans in here? Raise your hand. You know what the Republicans have in mind for you at the VA? To give you a voucher. 
These aren't just the right-wing crackpots like Christine O'Donnell and that Anglo woman from Nevada. I think she, she's gambling with our future. Not just them, but people like Boehner and McCain and Mitch McConnell saying that we have to give veterans vouchers and reel in the VA, one of the best health care systems in America. Think about that for a minute. Think about what happens if we stay home. Think about what happens if we elect these folks to a majority. Their objective is to privatize. I know how many of you, probably almost all of you in both countries, United States and Canada, have to fight every election, have to fight after every election to make sure that public transit gets the kind of support it needs in the political system. Mass transit. Working people need mass transit. The tens of thousands in cities, the millions across two countries that rely on mass transit to get to work because they can't afford parking downtown or they can't afford two cars or sometimes can't afford any car. What happens when they privatize mass transit? What happens to the ridership? What happens when they don't fund it enough? I know that you fight that fight. I read it in your magazine. I'm on the mailing list. And I don't think there's a magazine edition that comes out that doesn't have some story about it, about the struggle you're having, the struggle you're having, and in many times it's save our ride. These are the kind of challenging times where we have to look at our disappointments. I want to talk about that. We have to look at our disappointments and say, yeah, we didn't go as far as fast, or we didn't get exactly what we want, but you know what? We're making progress. But let me give you a fact that you may or may not have. Under Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in the last 20-some months, the House of Representatives has passed over 350 bills, including health care with a public option, including passage of the Employee Free Choice Act as we dreamt it would be, including many, many, many things that President Obama campaigned on. President Obama didn't interfere and say, don't do that. He encouraged them to do it. Then those bills made it to the Senate. On every bill, every one, with the exception of the Recovery Act, where Arlen Specter switched his vote and they ran him out of their party. On every bill that came before that Senate, Republicans blocked it using an arcane system of the filibuster. There would have been no, no economic recovery. There was no employee free choice. There's a health care bill that moves us in the right direction, but isn't a health care bill that any of us wanted. But it still moved us in the right direction. There's no occupational health and safety improvement. There's no increased funding for mass transit. It wasn't the Democrats that did that, brothers and sisters. It was the Republicans that did that. So we have a real right to be angry. We have a real right to be frustrated. But we don't have a right to sit on our ass while the Republicans prohibit us from getting the future we deserve. We have an obligation to stand and fight. 
We have an obligation to get in the street. We have an obligation to talk to our friends and neighbors and family. And we have an obligation to tell the truth. That old saying, the truth will set us free. I put my mind back. I put my mind back to the health care debate. Well, we tried to forge a compromise. You can have a debate. I actually thought that was a stupid thing to do. I'd have just run over those bastards if it had been me, but then it's not me, you know? Excuse the language, I get wired up sometimes. Three cups of coffee and away I go. That the, the reality is, the reality is that it was the dream that somehow we could get rational leadership out of the Republican Party and we could forge a compromise that would move America in the right direction and give us the kind of health care where every American had health care that they wouldn't have to worry. By the way, like almost every other advanced democracy in the world, my friends are here from Canada. I can guarantee you, you can ask any one of those Canadians, would you switch your health care system, whether it's in British Columbia or Ontario or anywhere else in the country, would you switch your health care system for the system that you have in the United States? And I'll bet you unanimously they'd say no. I was kind of worried you'd stay silent. <laughs> but the reality is this. While we spent seven months trying to forge a compromise, Republicans that are now seen as the leaders of their party, from Sarah Palin to that dingbat from Minnesota, Michelle, whatever her hell her name is. Yeah. I try to blank that stuff out sometimes, you know. They were out there talking about death panels. They were out there telling seniors that if we improved health care, they would be put on the dying list. At the same time, kids were dying. Kids were dying because the health insurance company had said, you've reached your limit. And we've let them tell those lies to discourage ordinary folks who don't get their news from the places you get it from. You know, let's, let's go out and tell the truth. John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and the hairpins that are going to run with them are saying that they're going to roll back Obama's health care plan. Let's figure out what that means. That means they're going to go out and campaign on, if they've got the guts, to do away with the right of your son or daughter to stay on your health care plan till they're 26. So if your son or daughter is going off to college, they got no health care. Are they really going to do that? Are they going to campaign by saying it's okay to deny health care coverage to a child that's born with a pre-existing condition? Do you know that they denied health care coverage to a woman because she had been raped? And they call that a pre-existing condition? That doesn't make the news very often, does it? Are they going to campaign on the fact that for seniors the donut hole will be closed, saving them hundreds of dollars? They're not going to do that. They're going to campaign by fooling the people, by calling Obamacare socialism. I've seen some of these nut jobs call it socialism, communism, and fascism in the same breath. They don't have a clue what the hell they're talking about. They don't have a clue what they're talking about, and they're scaring the hell out of America. You know, we, 
we sometimes misguide ourselves. You watch what the Republicans do. And they campaign on fear. Watch what they do. What's their program? Everything is about scaring you about something that's going to happen. This week, we got some really good examples of whose side they're really on. There was a vote on Tuesday in the Senate. The issue before the Senate was to take the tax breaks away from the companies that move jobs overseas. Seems like that would make sense. And to give tax breaks for two years to companies that move jobs back from overseas in this country. To me, that seems absolutely logical. Why reward someone for moving your job overseas? Why not reward someone for bringing a job back? How many Republican votes did it get? Do you follow it? Every Republican voted against that bill and then promised to filibuster it. These are the same guys, and they're mostly guys. They're mostly old rich guys. They're the same ones that said we should extend the Bush tax cuts for the ultra-rich. <coughs> and then at the same time, a couple of weeks before, we're saying, well, if you want to extend unemployment insurance, you had to find a way to pay for it. Do you know how much extending the Bush tax cuts adds to the deficit? Depending on which economist you're thinking about. Remember, these are the guys running their mouth. You'll see all kinds of ads, scare ads about the deficit. You've actually got an ad where a guy starts digging. Then he digs and digs. Then he's got a big hole. Then they say, well, you know, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Then it's a tax thing. They didn't do anything about that when they said that they want to extend the Bush tax cuts for the ultra-rich. That tax cut will add between 700 and 900 billion, depending on which economist you're listening to, to the deficit. That's more money that was spent in the economic renewal program. That, just that, would pay for health care for every American. Just that. And by the way, will I talk about this in American terms? With the exception of health care, which my Canadian friends know we fight for and fight about every day, every right-wing government in Canada tries to starve the system, and we fight every day. Same thing with public transit. We have the same kind of fights. Every right-wing government cuts transfer payments to the province that cuts transfer payments to the city. Then the city stuck, can't find a way to fund the, the, its mass transit program. There's a, there's a right-wing, rich person, global agenda. And we ought not to mistake that. And we need to confront that. Because our vision is the right vision. Nobody should have to worry about getting sick or a child getting in an accident or when you're at the end of your life after you've worked 25, 30, 40, 50 years for some people? That you lose everything you had because you got in an accident? Imagine, just take these things and imagine them. Just the first things I talked about. Privatizing Social Security. Our pension funds are in the ditch because of Wall Street corruption. Big business in Wall Street are working like hell to get every set of negotiations where there's a union to say we can't afford the defined benefit plan anymore. You've got to go to a defined contribution. 
and you already that or you got to get some kind of 401k bullshit. You know, 401k is a savings plan. It's not a pension plan. Don't try and fool me. You know. If they succeed, look around at yourselves. It's just like being at a steelworker meeting. There aren't a lot of under 30s in our meetings. They've made it very, very difficult in America and in Canada to form a union. They want to make it difficult for us to form unions because we're the last, we're the last line of defense for middle class families. Think about your labor movement. Think about your labor movement. If the labor movement wasn't here, who would be standing up for working people? If the labor movement wasn't here, who would be pushing progressive ideas in the political arena, whether it's at the municipal level or the federal level or the provincial or state level? Nobody but us. So don't be surprised that they fight us so hard. Have that raise your commitment to fight even harder. Because if you look around, we have an obligation, an obligation to leave a better world for our kids and grandkids. I say to our members when I get a chance to talk, this isn't about me anymore. This isn't about you anymore. We've had a great life even if it's been hard. When I was 18, I went into a plant and I had a union. It allowed me to go to school at night. It allowed me to raise my family. What I want now is for my kids and my grandkids to have the same shot in life I've had. And if I let these Republicans win in America or conservatives win in Canada, and if I let their ideology succeed, that my kids will be pushed back to the kind of poverty that existed when the ATU was founded. And if you don't believe it, go to the Maquiladora in Mexico and see workers who live in boxes because they can't get paid enough by the same global multinationals who are trying to stick it in our rectum. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, we need to fight. We need to never give up. We need to find the energy that needs to be found to, after working a long day, to donate a few hours to do something, walk the block and go tell the friends and neighbors the truth, challenge the stuff. <coughs> Far too often we don't challenge the lies. I mean, God Almighty. There's a woman that's going to run for Senate in Delaware that says evolution doesn't exist. You know? There's a woman in Nevada and about 35 other Republican candidates who have signed a pledge to eliminate the minimum wage. These are the same people that have said they ought to do away with the Department of Education. How many of you know that in the Economic Renewal Bill, George Miller, great congressman from California, took the right of banks to control student loans for kids going to college away from them and brought the student loan system back to the federal government so that now that kids that go to school that want to get a student loan don't get jacked around and pay 30% interest rate when they come out of school and can't get a job. <laughs> Nobody's playing that stuff on television commercials. Let me close because I know you got important business ahead. You heard about our union and myself and your union being partners. 
in the formation of the Blue-Green Alliance. And some of you might be saying, what the hell is that about? It's an alliance of environmentalists and trade unionists that have come to the conclusion that first of all, you can't fix the environment on the backs of workers. And secondly, as the workers, we gotta be concerned about the environment for the next generation. So that as we walk through this, we try not to be divided. And the position that our union takes, it's not about having a clean environment and no jobs. It's not about having lots of jobs in a rotten environment. You either got to have both good jobs and a cleaner environment, or you'll have neither in the long run. And I can't think of, I can't think of very many things that are as environmentally positive as massive investments in mass transit. I can't think of anything that's better for the environment. I can't think of anything that's better for the environment than more fuel efficient buses, more high speed rail that will take cars off the highway and take us out of the downtown. And my friends in the auto workers know that as well. They join the Blue Green Alliance because we can make different kinds of cars. Or instead of making cars, why the hell aren't we making buses in this country anymore? I think when I left Canada about 16 years ago, we had one company that I knew of that made, still made buses. I don't know if they still exist. I do know this, that as we fight for more mass transit, which I think is a fight that needs to be engaged by more than the ATU and the transit unions, everyone in the labor movement ought to be engaged in that fight. But we also ought to fight whether those buses are for Canada or whether they're for the US, that they have North American domestic content just like we do in the auto industry, and that we quit importing Chinese buses and German buses and French buses, and we start making those buses in America, and we put more bus drivers behind those buses, and we put people back to work, and we clean the environment. So I'm proud of the friendship that our union has in, uh, in many cities, we ally together. And I know that uh, when I was in Canada, uh, that I had uh, a tremendous friendship with Ken Foster. He got me into a lot of trouble lots of times, brought me to restaurants where I ate bad stuff. And if it wouldn't have been for him, I wouldn't have eaten that. I wouldn't look like this now. <laughs> We've worked closely in Pittsburgh. We've worked closely in Cleveland. We've worked closely in Chicago. We work closely in a lot of places together because your values are our values and your union's history is a proud history, one that we're proud to align ourselves with. Let me just say that when I, uh, when I travel around, I, uh, I often would like to buy souvenirs for my kids when they were younger. And uh, one time when I was in San Francisco, I went looking for uh, a nice souvenir for my wife or my daughter. And I went down into the Chinatown area. And I'm wandering around and I saw this old gift shop. I walked in, I looked around, and they had this huge brass doorstop of a rat sitting down. But the eyes on that rat just looked right through you. And I thought, what well, kind of weird looking thing, but be a hell of a good doorstop on a windy day, pretty heavy. So I asked the guy at the gift shop, I said, uh, how much for the rat? He said, the rat's only $15, but the story's 200. I said, listen, man, I, all I want the rat for is a doorstop, so I don't need the story, just uh, give me the rat. He said, you're gonna be back for the story. I said, no, no, forget it, I just want the rat. He said, okay. Bought the rat, I left, started walking back towards my hotel. And as I started walking, I heard, I looked behind me and there's like a half a dozen rats. Well, that's kind of weird. Must be in a 
bad area of town or something. Keep walking, and all of a sudden, I look behind, there's now like 500 rats. I said, holy God. So I start walking a little faster, and all of a sudden, they're jumping on me and biting at my ass and everything else, and I, I turn around, there's like a million rats. And I start running, I'm near the San Francisco Bridge, and I just heave that brass red. I figure that must be what they're after. And about a million rats ran off the bridge into the water and drowned. I figured, oh my God. So I make my way back to that gift shop. No rats following me. So I know it's the brass rat. Somehow those eyes must have been something. So I walk in and the little Asian man is sitting there. He says, ah, I told you you'd be back. He said, uh, yeah. He said, I bet you come back for the story. I said, hell no. You have a brass Republican? <laughs> Thank you very much.